Good crowd here for prayer meeting this evening. Praise the Lord. Love it when we have a lot of prayer requests, because that's what we ought to be doing, praying one for another. You're turning your Bibles to Ezra chapter 10. Let me give you a couple of announcements coming up. First of all, the senior class of 2018, we're already talking about this, are collecting items for donation because they want to have, they're, have, they're organizing a garage sale um, to help fund their senior trip. They, they, want to get a, they want to get ahead on this. So if you've got anything that they can come and pick up and Craigslist for you or sell and they can have the proceeds for their senior trip, just see myself or see the Missy Porter. See Missy, don't see me. She'll come get it. And she can lift up heavy stuff too. That old fridge, Missy will get it. That pallet of bricks that's been in your backyard, Missy will get it. Poor Jim. Yeah, there you go. Got, got a fridge. Oh, here it's coming. <laughs> oh, the heavier. Come on, we need something heavier. We don't want more expensive. We want heavier. What do you got? There you go. Bundles of shingles. You got a 2003 Buick. This, this is like an auction. These kids are going to go to Europe. Forget Boston. A couple of other announcements uh, coming up. Newcomers class is starting on June 25th, and so that's not this Sunday, the following Sunday. And so if you know folks that are interested in church membership or wanting to learn how to become more, uh, more part of a manual, uh, let us know. Uh, junior camp, sign up needs to, you need to let the Irishes know ASAP if you're planning on sending your young person. Junior camp, Camp Canaanland, $100. It's fantastic. Leave on Monday, come back on Friday. There's about, I think there's six couples, six of us going up there, and so we'll be camping with them. And so that's July 10th to the 14th. Morgan Burna's is uh, soon to be Levesque. Bridal shower is this Friday at 6 p.m. That'll be happening uh, in the Fellowship Hall. The men's dads and lads camp out will be outside. Uh, and then there's also a youth group event that'll be happening here on the property part of it, and the girls are going to be going off. So a lot going on Friday night. Dads and lads. Uh, show up after 4 p.m., stake out your spot. You, kind of everyone knows where we usually camp along the side of the property. There's hookup over here if you want to bring an RV. And uh, on that night, we'll have some grills out here available. Bring your own snacks and meat to grill on in Friday evening. Saturday morning, we'll wake up. There'll be sausage and eggs and pancakes for breakfast. And so we'll make that. And so make plans. There's going to be cornhole competition, spike ball, bonfire, and Brother Bruce, tell me the name of, of your yard game. Bok Bok Bogok. It is the it is it is the coming summer hit of yard games. And so we're gonna we're gonna try this out. So if you want to see what this is all about, you gotta come uh, Friday night. If you don't plan on staying overnight, you can still come. Just come and hang out a couple hours. When it gets dark, people just kind of wander away. We wake up with far fewer. Far fewer that went to bed that night are here in the boarded, but that's all right. Just come out, hang out with us. We'll spray the yard for mosquitoes and all that stuff, so make plans to be here. And then Guns and Grub is on Saturday. We're going to get out there. You need to be there ready to go by 10 a.m. Brother Mike Somkowski will be doing a gun safety uh, briefing. He's an NRA certified range instructor. He has like one of the highest red, uh, level certifications. So he'll be doing that. So make plans to be there if you're shooting particularly, so that you got to be part of that. Um, and then we'll be eating and preaching about noon. And so if you're coming for that part of it, and make sure you sign up in the connector. You can pay in the connector as well. A couple of things. There, the address that is, that is there, that's where you're going to kind of use your Google Maps to get to. Josh printed some addresses. If you're going to come in, we suggest you carpool in trucks. It's dry enough. If you're in a full-size truck, you should be able to make it where we're shooting clays on. We're, you're gonna drive through the farm a little bit uh, in between a couple fields. Small trucks and cars probably are not gonna make it. They probably would make it, we just don't wanna risk it. We don't want you to hurt your car and we don't wanna spend time having to pull you out. So you're just gonna park by the road and hitch a ride in. We'll have people that can get you in so you can hitch a ride. But if you can kinda tag team with some other folks that are driving in on a truck and we'll have trucks going back and forth um, that should be uh, great, and then well, all the food and everything is provided for you out there. Bring shells. Um, 
to shoot and follow all the instructions on the flyers. There is a good chance of rain. We can't shoot during rain because, first of all, the clays will all dissolve. Um, but we're smoking the chicken on Friday. So if anything, we're going to eat here on Saturday. And so there'll be eating going on Saturday or something, and we'll, have to, we'll rain date the shooting event, but we'll kind of get the word out about that uh, as that happens. But Lord willing, we're just going to have a great event. So that's coming up. And then next week, it's the Michigan Revival Conference. Um, we'll begin participating in earnest on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. There's daytime meetings up at Landmark Baptist Church in Clio. You won't want to miss that. But the big meetings are in the evenings, 7 o'clock, at First Baptist Church in Bridgeport. A bus or vehicle will be leaving the church here every night at 5.30. If you want to hitch a ride up there, participate. And th those, those meetings are going to be, we're, we're praying, are going to be large meetings. It's going to be revival meetings, singing, choir, and all that. They are having a conference choir. If you want to participate in that, just let me know. You've got to show up an hour early, and they have a practice going on and, and whatnot. And you can participate uh, in the conference choir. But we're really asking God to move in a powerful way in our state. And he already has. Uh, just by the sheer number of independent Baptist preachers that are running all together on this and working together and praying together and working and aligning their church calendars together to make this a, a deal. And so at one aspect, revival has already broken out because the brethren are getting along and going and doing it and have a vision for it. And that, that can only happen under revival. And, uh, but we want you to be a part of that. And we need it. Uh, you need it. And a night of preaching is always a good night. And these are going to be premier guys coming in, and they've been pr praying and preparing for this for well over a year. So make plans. Next Wednesday night, we're going to take a bus up there as well. We'd love to have a big crowd up there. Come up there. Um, but if you, if you can't make it up there, church will happen here, and we're going to simulcast that as well uh, going on. Pray for Brother Josh. The whole hopes of the state are resting on Brother Josh Levesque's shoulders. I'm not kidding you. He is in charge. He's old. We, we took on the burden of live streaming this event. And we, that's why we've been working with all this stuff for months, getting better at it so that we could do it well. But it's live TV on the Internet. I mean, anything could happen. And, uh, and Josh is the person, like, at the very focal point of all that happening. And we're getting a lot of phone calls from non-technologically savvy pastors just worried. that this is, We told them to have it at the church and everything. So pray for Josh. It's going to be a stressful week for him. He's going to be detached. So on Sunday, he won't be here. He's going to be following the conference all week. And so it's going to be uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday down here. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it moves up to the northern half. And so Brother Jenkins at Grace Baptist is going to be hosting the day. Um, uh, Brother Lee, uh, Buddy Rust, Rusty Chatfield and Northern Michigan Baptist is participating. Brother Ke uh, Raider at Fundamental Baptist Church in Kenross is participating. So it's amazing what God is doing. And so but pray for Brother Josh in particular because he has it on him right now. Uh, and we're going to be helping him. And we got staff and everything. But he's got his hand on the nuclear button, literally. And um, so pray for that. And then 1776 Sunday coming up, July the 2nd. Order your costumes now. You don't want to miss out. Listen, I know some of you were like, well, I don't know. And then after you saw it, you said... That was cool. That was awesome. Don't miss it this year. Be a part, and uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit more on Camp Out Night. And so we'll get you some ideas on what we're going to be doing with that as well. All right. Ezra chapter 10. Been loving what the Lord's just been working through, the, the, working through Ezra. Had not fully intended this to become a full-out series. Um, we started with preaching on the concept of the hand of the Lord. Because Ezra uses that phrase almost exclusively in the scriptures. That the hand of the Lord was upon him. And we talked about the blessings of the hand of the Lord and the burden of the hand of the Lord. Now we're going to, last week we preached in chapter 9. We'll review that here in a second. But we are in Ezra chapter 10. And verse 1. Now when Ezra had prayed, and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto, unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women, for the people wept very 
sore. And Shekinah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Praise the Lord for God's hope. Praise the Lord for his grace. Even in the darkest moment, beloved, and wherever you're at today, there's hope in God. There is hope in God. There is salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that and, and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God. And let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. And we also will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. Then arose Ezra. And made the chief priests, the Levites, and all of Israel to swear that they should do according to this word, and they swear. Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God and went into the chamber of Jehanan, the son of Elishab. And when he came thither, he did, he did eat no bread nor drink water, for he mourned because of the transgressions of them that had been carried away. And they made proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem unto all the children of the captivity that they should gather themselves together unto Jerusalem. And that whosoever would not come within three days, according to the counsel of the princes and the elders, all his substance should be forfeited and himself separated from the congregation of those that had been carried away. Then all the men of Judah... And Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. And it was the ninth month on the twelfth day of the month, on the uh, the twentieth day of the month, excuse me. And all the people sat in the street of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and for the great rain. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore, make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers, and do his pleasure, and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. The title of my message tonight is A Right Response. A right response. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for what is recorded for us here in the book of Ezra. Lord, is your prophet, your scribe, a man of the word, faithful to your word, preaching your word, or proclaiming it. And Lord, your word doing what it rightly does, changing the hearts of men, calling them to repentance and to a right response. Well, I pray tonight is particularly in light of us preparing for a time of revival. Lord, a time of returning back to normal. Lord, to live uh, the Christian life as you have for us to live, uh, separated and holy unto you. Well, I pray that you would help us as we hear the preaching of your word, as we read your word personally and devotionally, or as we are encouraged by good Christian literature, that when your spirit speaks to us, Lord, that we would determine to have a right response. Lord, we love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember last time we left Ezra in chapter 9, praying slash preaching this great prayer of repentance. He had come as they returned to Jerusalem. He acknowledged and realized that they had taken to themselves strange women and to strange wives. And now they were starting to once again reintegrate themselves with the people of the land that God had expressly forbidden them to do. Uh, For all all intentional purposes, what this applies to us tonight is they had become yoked in sin. They had yoked themselves with, with things that were not what God had desired, that God hated, that God was angry about, uh, and that God was determined to receive or return his people out of. 
And beloved, there are times in your life where you find yourself, where God confronts you with the fact of sin that is yoked to you in your life, and the call is to separate from that sin, to, to pull yourself from that by His grace and by His power. And of course, this happens when we come to a place of real repentance. And that's what we preached about last time. And beloved, there's really never going to be a real change if there's real repentance. Uh, there, there's really not going to ever have the right actions or the right response until we have the real repentance that Ezra here in chapter 9 modeled for us in his words. And perhaps as we preached through that last time, we have to realize that, that Ezra was not only praying this, but he was praying this and speaking these words publicly. And there was, a, according to the beginning per, a part of chapter 9, there was a group of people already assembled around him. You remember from last time, and this idea of real repentance, that real repentance requires shame for your sin and recognizes the consequences of your sin and realizes God's grace and mercy for your sin and reckons the offensiveness towards God of your sin. And Ezra preached this as much as he prayed it when he learned of the people's sin of marrying strangers, particularly resulting in children. Ezra 9.4 says, "...were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of God." And we learn here in chapter 10 that when they heard this from Ezra, and when we're, they were confronted by their sin, they had a right response. They had a right response. Beloved, understand this. Real repentance initiates a right response towards God. Real repentance will always initiate a right response towards God. Without genuine repentance, you will never have the right response. Until you've come to that place of repentance, your responses will always be half measures. Your responses will always be cover-ups. Your responses will be things that aren't, that aren't pleasing to God, but things that are masking and covering up your own dissatisfaction with your own life. And so a lot of times our responses, uh, without genuine repentance... Our responses are simply things enough to appease our conscience because we were poked at a little bit. So the preacher gets up or you're reading your Bible and God sticks you with something and you realize, oh me, oh my, I've offended God in these things. And instead of really being truly repentful and throwing yourself at the mercy of God and meaning whatever it means, God, I want this to be right with you, we do just enough. To justify, just enough to appease, just enough to satisfy so I can go on with my day and not feel like a total, the total scum of the earth. Like you ought to feel when you've offended God. That's how you ought to feel. I mean, you ought to feel as the low is low. Me, a child of God, saved by his grace, purchased by the blood of Christ, and now I've offended him in such a way, that is supposed to make you feel bad. In a society that doesn't want to ever feel bad, We've robbed ourselves of the usefulness of mourning. We've robbed ourselves of the usefulness of sorrowing over sin. And so without genuine repentance, you will never have a right response. And conversely, beloved, no response means no repentance. No response. So God convicts you and you think you go through the same. But if it doesn't cause an action to happen, for you to do something about that, to make amends or to do, to correct what has happened, then, beloved, perhaps there's never been true repentance yet. Because repentance is willing to do whatever God requires once it has been acknowledged. Not a half measure. Not a step back. Not, not, not something quiet. Notice the type of people that we are talking about tonight. And if you underline your Bible, just mark a couple of notes here. In verse nine, chapter 9 and verse 4, those that assembled to him were those that trembled at his word. God's word. 10.3, the Bible says... Um, 10.3, it says, And those... And of those that trembled at the commandments of our God. Verse 9. We find, as they've heard the word of God, these people trembling because of this matter. 
for the, and for the great rain, trembling outside in the rain. And so who is this, who, who is this for tonight, really? I mean, who, who are the ones that are going to have the right response? Who is this really going to hit home with? Because, beloved, in, in, in a congregation aside, undoubtedly what's going to happen here is there's going to be a certain measure, and I don't wish it. I, I, I hope I'm wrong in this. Maybe it owed me a little faith. But there, but there will be some that say, this does not apply to me. Or I'm not going to take what the preacher is saying seriously. But notice the commonality of these people here. They all, the type of person that responds to what we are about to say here is those that tremble at the word of God. I mean, they see it for what it is. They believe in his law. They don't, they don't think it's God's opinions or God's philosophies. If God says it, that believes it, that settles it. And if God calls me uh, a no good loser because I'm involved in the sin, then guess what? I'm a no good loser because I'm involved in that sin. That's just, that's just the fact of the matter. And what we need today in America are more people that tremble at the word of God. That's what we need. But let that begin in the house of God. And if there are any people that would tremble at the word of God, it ought to be us. It ought to be us that read God's word and, and read that and go, oh me, oh my. It ought to be us that read that. And we, even when we see God's judgments that might not be applied to us, but be applied to others, as we see what, and with a prophetic, prophetic vision, what's happening around the world around the world today, and we understand through the lens of Scripture that why these things are happening. We tremble because these are the words of God. And his law is coming to complete fruition. Beloved, God has spoken. And what he has said will happen. Will happen. Those that he said are redeemed in the blood of the Lamb will have an eternal home in heaven. Why? Because he said it. He promised it. But those who reject the Son will spend eternity in hell. No arguing with it. Why? Why? How do you know that? Because he said it. That's what he said. That's just what's going to happen. Don't, you take your argument up with God. And so these are the type of people that trembled at his word. Oh, that I would be that person. Oh, that you would be that person. Trembled at his word. Big idea. Allow repentance to create the right response to God's truth in your life. You must allow repentance to create the right response to God's truth in your life. Sometimes we think as repentance is the destination, but that's really the starting point. When we really get to repentance, now we're really getting out of the hole. Now, we're, now, now God is working to restore us. But part of that restoration is having a right response. Three things real quick about their right response here. Number one, they acted. They acted. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. Now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God. That's basically the summary of chapter 9. There assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children. For the people wept very sore. Look down at verse 9. I'm going to kind of parallel because there's these two incidents. One, and the scope gets a little bit bigger, but they mirror themselves. Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves after the proclamation went out together unto Jerusalem within three days. And it was the ninth month on the 20th day of the month. And all the people sat in the street of the house of God trembling because of this matter for and for the great Rain. They assembled themselves together. First of all, they acted. They acted. They didn't hear God's truth and turn a deaf ear to it. They didn't hear God's truth and be dumb-faced to it. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, I mean, sometimes, you ever like when you're, you're, you're correcting your children or you're telling your children something and you say something to them and there's supposed to be a response. And they're, what? Huh? No, no, we're not there yet, Dad. We're not there yet. 
Notice here, as Ezra is making this cry of repentance and representing this in a prayer to God and in preaching towards people, the people heard this, and the first thing they did was they acted, and they acted by assembling. In other words, they literally moved. They went from one position, and they went to another position. And this is the point that I'm making here. They did not internalize this. They didn't just hear God's truth, internalize it, let it be a little platitude, something to help pick them up for their day. No, no. It caused them to physically move in location. They, they assembled themselves. And as, as Ezra is preaching this and praying this, the crowd that is gathered, there's people mourning, people are walking by going, what's going on here? They hear the words of Ezra and they join the mourners so much so that the Bible says that the men, the women, and the children were, a, were weeping sorely. Amazing. See, an inward convincing resulted in an outward action. It resulted in that. They heard something that caused them to be moved. Not only did they assemble, but they abased. Verse 1, for the people wept very sore. Verse 9, they sat in the street in the rain. That's my paraphrase. I said it like I said in the Bible. I said it in my Bible reading voice. There was no quotes around that. They abased. In other words, they humbled themselves. So not only they moved, they, they physically moved themselves because a physical action was the result of hearing God's truth. But not only that, there was a humility in their, in their response. And, and in, in the first section, they, they wept sorely and, and they grieved. And the other ones sat out in the rain in the street because there were so many of them. Now, beloved, I, I can't think of anything more humbling and humiliating that when you're hearing God's word, and they, as they were hearing God's word preach, and they realized, oh, this is me, this is me, and, and we got to get this right with God, and they sat there not even looking for cover. Uh, they, they didn't look for uh, a shelter. They just sat there in the streets and let the rain of God fall upon them in complete humility. See, they acted. They acted in the assembly. They acted in, in that they, they were abased. Look at verse 10, uh, 12. They acted in that. Then all the congregation, that they've all gathered together. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice. Said with a loud voice. They answered. They answered. Ezra preaches the word, makes the accusation. They know it. We're gonna you, you, look at the end of your chap your 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 verse, your book there, chapter ten. You see that thing that looks like a genealogy? That's all the priests and scribes that had married themselves to strange women. That's the list of offenders. I mean, this was the top. The top of the top. Recorded for eternity in scripture of their offense. And so they cried out with a loud voice. Yes. What, what you are saying, yes. Or, or if we could put it in our vernacular, yes, a amen. Then the, all the congregation answered and said with a, with a loud voice, as thou hast said, so must we do. In other words, beloved, when God give, brings you to the place of repentance, the first right response, or, or, or to have a right response, number one, is to act, to do, to, 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 not, to not be dumb-faced before God, but to respond to what He is doing in your life, to be moved by God, to be moved by God. Well, who moves for God anymore? I'm, I'm, listen, I'm not over-spiritualizing this. I'm, I'm hyper-simplifying this. Literally, who moves for God? What was, the, what was the last time you moved for God? In other words, that God impressed you with such truth that you said, I, I was impressed with that truth in this spot, and I just got to get into this spot. I mean, literally just moved by what it is. And now listen, how can that happen? I mean, who's been moved by God? There's been times when I'm in my office and I'm reading the Word of God and, 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 and things come up. i got to walk around. 
In, in other words, there is something physical that happens to a spiritual decision that has taken place. There's something, beloved, about being physically moved by God. I'm not talking about being a charismatic here. We're not talking about being undo, uh, un, uh, something in chaos, uncontrolled. But I'm just saying things that move you. Maybe we can we contextualize this a little bit in our society. The amen and the, and the altar call. Beloved, both modern practices that very much mo- model biblical practices. Both of them. Amen? I mean, I mean, listen, in other words, Ezra was saying something, and the people didn't just look at him and go... Amen. Amen. You know, there was, there was, there was that there. And, and listen, I'm not fishing for amen, but those what's going on here. This is what he, that, that they called back with a loud voice and they physically moved themselves. Both are modern practices, very much. The amen and the altar call, we can, we can do this other ways, but we're talking about in the context here of a physical response to a spiritual decision. They responded. It's appropriate on Wednesday night. We don't have altar calls on Wednesday night. We're not going to have one tonight. So I'll say it like this. When we preach, on, when I preach on Sundays, we're going to have an altar call. Whether you like it or not. It's just going to happen every time. Because I'm not preaching to tickle your fancy. Or to make you excited about something. Or really... To, to make you feel good, and I'm surely not preaching for y'all to think, well, that, bless that heart, that young man, just up there, and I, I don't get young man very much anymore. <laughs> but bless his heart, man, he really? Fully on that? Because we're preaching the word of God that we tremble at, and, and then when we tremble at the word of God, the preaching is pointed to make you move. Sometimes, you, you ever get the idea in the back of your mind? I think he wants us to move. That's the right idea you have in your mind. That's the right idea. Now, now listen. I don't want you to move for me. Be on a move for God. Let's think I move every time. But beloved, for some of you, and I'll say this as generic as possible, your attendance at the altar means that God has never spoken. Just saying. Let, it, let that sit where it is. But, but listen, it's not, a, it's not a sideshow. It's not a carnival act. It's not a vestige of a bygone era. And, you know, sooner or later, Emmanuel's going to catch up with the time, and they're, they're going to stop having altar calls. Nope. We're going to keep preaching the Word of God, because we're going to preach it in such a way with a proposition that has a point, that has a spear, that makes you want to move, and then we're going to sit here, and someone's going to go over there and sing, and I'm just going to stand here, and listen, when everyone comes or when no one comes, I feel no different. No different. So I'm not preaching to please you, I'm preaching to please him. Doesn't matter. But listen, I'll stand here and be God's fool every single Sunday. Doesn't matter. Doesn't hurt my feelings. Doesn't make me feel better. I don't think that the points are more alliterated and better pointed when the altar is full. It doesn't make anything. Nope. Because I've taken care of that with God before I even step behind this pulpit. What I'm telling you here is I do you a disservice if I don't continually motivate you to move for God. I'm not being the preacher I ought to be for you. I'm not preaching that book. So notice here, they acted. They, they, there was an action. They, 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 they moved. But you deal with that in your own heart, and your own mind. But I'm saying all throughout the scriptures, you can see a physical response to a spiritual decision. It's just there. It's just there. All over the place. Secondly, they confessed. They confessed. Look at verse 2. We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land, yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Look down at verse 11. Now there... uh, Yeah, verse 11. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers 
do his pleasure. See, they, they, the right response is, number one, they acted, but the right response, number two, is they confessed. In other words, they made their acknowledgement of their offense towards God. But understand this. Your offense is not to me. So, man, Pastor Jay, you're preaching, and that, that made me feel bad. And I just want to say I'm sorry. Don't say sorry to me. Because I'm not preaching Jason George's. Uh, I'm not preaching my preference. What we're preaching here is the Word of God, and if the Holy Spirit convicts you, then your offense is towards God. That's who you've offended. Acknowledge your confession to Him. In other words, don't say sorry to me, say sorry to God. Say sorry to God. See, their offense was toward God. They acknowledged their offense towards God. And notice this, they identified their offense towards God. Verse 2, we have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Let me tell you what this was not. This was not the weak, Father, forgive us, as we have somehow, possibly unknowingly to us, failed you. That has to be the sorriest prayer to believers pray. The generic the generic we, the generic some possibility, but I can't possibly think of one right now, so I'm just going to throw it off. Who are we kidding? Hey, beloved, if we were to really get honest with God, we would never have to resort to the generic we ever, or the generic, uh, what, if I've ever trespassed you, the trespass is if we're honest with ourselves and walking circumspectly and getting, and getting in this word and hearing the preaching of God's word, we have to say, man. God, I, could, I know the things I'm dealing with right now, and I know the things that are on the top. And beloved, we know the, the lists are long, but at different times in your life, there are things that God, are deal, God is dealing with you then and now. And so, yes, the, we, we want to hide behind the, the maybe, maybe the genericness of the list is to indicate the broadness of the list. <laughs> too many to number, God. But notice what they did. Nope. God, we've offended you. And let, us tell, let, me, let me kind of give you chapter. God, we're going to repeat back to you chapter and verse for what we did. We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. That's the, you know, Article 1, Section 2. That's the one we broke right there. That's the law. That's the commandment. That was the instruction that we broke. See, confession must be specific and confession must be personal. That's the right response. So the Lord brings you to a point of repentance, and now you say, I'm going to move, I'm going to act. I'm going to respond to the truth that God has shown me, whether in the context of a church service, the context of my life, by going and correcting the actions, I'm not just going to listen to it dumb-faced. But then, as confession is made to God, it's specific. God, this is, what I've, this is what you've impressed upon me right now. This is the sin that you've convicted me of. And, and beloved, sometimes that comes in the form of, God, you, I just, you just convinced me of this truth, and right now in my house there is this. And right now in my dealings there is this. And right now in my possession there is this. And, and you confess it to God specifically. And but for some of you, that might be top shelf of the closet, third drawer of the dresser, extra channels on the TV, whatever it might be, that's where it may, uh, the, the secret bank account somewhere, whatever it is, but you know exactly, and I'm telling you this, beloved, Jesus Christ died for your sin, but he died for those specific sins, and every single one was numbered against him, every transgression, and beloved, when you deal with God in confession, be specific. This is what you've said. This is where you've convicted me. And confession must be personal. Probably one of the most personal things we, ought, we do. Now notice in the context of what they did, these national sins, their confession was public. They publicized their offense towards God. Let me give you this guideline here, thought here. Confession must be as public as the sin. Now we're not talking about the erring or glorying in sin. 
That, that, that's sin, that's carnality and sensuality as well. We're, we're not saying that there's people that, that, well, listen, let me tell you how bad I am, and they go into, no, 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 no. But, but, but beloved, if someone has seen you offend God in your life, then you ought to make your apology. Part of your apology to God is by writing that with them. And so listen, let me give you a great context, man. In your home, you do something that's offensive to God. You led your family in a way that's offensive to God. Maybe you allowed some uh, indiscretions to your family. You took some liberties that were not right. God convicted you of it. You say, you know what? We don't need those movies. We don't need those channels. We don't need to be having these things going on in our home. But your kids saw it. Your wife saw it. They all know that you approved it. So daddy comes home one day, all of a sudden, throwing things in the trash can, throwing things and getting rid of it. But part of that needs to also be children before you and before God. I'm telling you that what I was doing was wrong. And I'm confessing, I've gotten it right with God, and now I'm leading us together, and we're going to get this right with God. See, confession ought to be as public as the sin was. Now, now listen, if you're in a town drunk, and the whole town in here knows you're a drunk, and you're a member, you're a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church, well, listen, that's going to get dealt with in a different way. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. Don't defame the name of Christ in that big a way. Phew. Don't do that. Avenge your sin. But if people know of your transgressions against the Lord, then apologize to God in front of them. Their, conf- their confession was public because the context of their sin was very national. Look at lastly, verse 3. We'll be done. Now therefore, let us make a covenant with our God and put away all the, all the wives and such as are born of them according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandments of our God. And let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. Having the right response, first of all, they acted. Secondly, they confessed. Thirdly, beloved, they committed. They committed. Now let us make a covenant with our God. Pastor Jay, I don't want to make a promise to God if I don't intend to keep it. Back to step one. We didn't come to true repentance yet. (laughs) Pastor Jay, I can't promise that to God. I'm only up here on the altar to kind of solve over, to put a little ointment on my transgressions this week, but I have full intention on being back in there next week. I can't make any promises. All right. Well, then that kind of movement is disingenuous. It didn't mean anything. And beloved, that's not repentance. But repentance is coming to the point that you're totally convinced that you're saying, God, by your grace and by your power, I'm leaving this behind. And I'm going to make some commitments to this. God, I want to make a commitment to you that you have convicted me. I've heard this truth. I've confessed it. I've called it by name. I, I, and God, and so look, listen, beloved, for some of you, sometimes what that means, and you might hear that during this revival conference, that means that you're going to hear a message. You're going to respond to the altar. You're going to confess to God at the altar exactly what God put on the Holy Spirit, put in your mind. And then you're going to go straight. And you're gonna, at the altar, you're going to say, and God, as soon as I get home, I'm going to go take that thing and I'm going to burn it. You're going to say, you say that. Make a commitment to God. 